Okay, um, since I see that a few people have already joined in, we might have more, but um, since it's time, I'd like to start our webinar. So thank you everybody for joining in today. Um, my name is Hazuki Mori of the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to our Access to Space for our initiative, Kibo Cube seventh round announcement of opportunity webinar. Um, before we begin, I have a few housekeeping rules. Um, first, please use the chat box to ask any questions that you may have. Uh, we will have a dedicated Q&A at the end of the webinar, but please do not wait until then. Um, send us your questions in the chat box. Second, um, please answer our questionnaire that we will be putting in the chat box later on. Um, as you can see, my colleague Wenbin will be active in the chat, providing you with useful links and information, and he will also put the link of the questionnaire there. So please make sure to answer um, our questionnaire before you leave. We would really like to receive your feedback. And third, last but not least, um, if you are on social media, please use the hashtag access to space for all and KiboCube to help us promote this webinar. We are active on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn at UNUSA. So um, I hope you see the agenda here. I will begin with intro the introduction to the Access to Space for All initiative and KiboCube. After that, I will give the floor to my colleague in JAXA, Ms. Yasko Shibano, for the introduction of the International Space Station, the Kibo module, and the Japanese um, Small Satellite Orbiter, Orbit Deployer. And last but not least, I will introduce my colleague, Jorge, to give you a more detailed explanation about the application form. Now, um, I'd like to begin on um, talking about the Access to Space for All initiative. I don't know how many of you have been participating in our webinars, so I'll give you a quick overview of our initiative. So UNOSA has been providing theoretical knowledge through the regional centers that we have, fellowships, workshops, and trainings, but to answer the needs of the actual hands-on opportunities, this initiative was um, organized in 2018. We realize this um, opportunity, I'm uh, sorry, the goal of this opportunity is to provide research and orbital opportunities for UN member states to access to space and to ensure that the benefits of space, in particular sustainable development, are truly accessible to all. And we realize this by providing access to unique ground and space infrastructures that are usually too costly or non accessible to developing countries. And we do this free of charge. And as you can see here, we have a wide range of intergovernmental industry partners and partnerships are a distinctive feature of our initiative. Um, the partners that are listed here, they are the ones that provide the access to state, the access to the state of the art facilities, infrastructures, and they provide the support of the development of the technical and scientific capabilities. Um, this slide will explain the core values of our initiative. First, um, through the initiative, we provide hands-on capacity from A to Z. What I mean by A to Z is that we provide the path to begin small and lead to complex skills. And we do this in a responsible and sustainable way. What I mean by responsible and sustainable is that we help provide structures, opportunities to comply with international guidelines. Another core value of the initiative is that it brings a social impact through inspiring young generations and also enlarging the chance for more investment in STI, science, technology, and innovation. Next, it fosters international cooperation. As you can see, our partners are mainly from developing nations, but um, by, um, by taking part in the initiative, you'll be able to work with them. And also, these days, we have teams that are formed um, with um, a few countries and a few um, universities put together. So we see a lot of international cooperation within the teams as well. And last but not least, um, the initiative provides cutting edge skills for jobs and other opportunities. All the benefits mentioned in the slide before link to the 17 sustainable development goals of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, which I hope you are all aware of. Um, this agenda has been adopted by all member states and it is a it is a desirable direction of transformation. And we really want to emphasize that space is relevant and can help to achieve these goals. As an initiative, um, the Access to Space for All especially fosters SDG number four, quality education, number eight, decent work and economic growth, and number nine, industry innovation and infrastructure. 
the technology and infrastructure that the participating teams achieve and build, the applications coming in from the projects that they develop, and the partners that uh, partnerships that they form all contribute to the SDGs. In the application form, um, we ask applicants to make links between their projects and the SDGs, and you can see some of the examples here. For example, the second round winner of drop test, which is an opportunity to use the Bremen drop tower in Germany, um, they tested the effects of Nichino in gravity. And Nichino is a material used in the medical field for manufacturing heart emulators. So it allowed them to understand the material more in detail. The seventh round team of the members of drop test as well, um, they were involved in developing a low cost ventilator for the fight against COVID-19. So this also demonstrates that the skills acquired through developing drop test experiments had a wide range of valuable outcomes. Another example is through KiboCube, we saw many workshops um, engaging and educating girls in STEM. Another example from KiboCube is that Quetzal-1, the first satellite of Guatemala, monitored the concentration of harmful bacteria over inland bodies of waters in Guatemala. So this also contributes to SGG number six. So as you can see here, we have a lot of connections um, between the projects and the SDGs. Now, this is a new slide for people who've known about our initiative. So our initiative is still in working progress and we are working to expand our support. So we are working to have more components that will support the actual hands-on opportunities that we have now. As you can see on the left side, we have a tool component that will introduce how to use tools such as software, open platforms, systems, and others that can help um, that, can, that are developed around the world to really efficiently and effectively utilize the hands-on opportunities under our hands-on component. The education component will provide theoretical foundation to participate in the hands-on component and how to use the tools under the tool components. So both of these new components, um, the tool component and the educational component, will be supporting the hands-on com hands component, which I will be explaining in the next page. So I think a lot of you are familiar with this, um, this page. Um, this is the hands-on component that we have now. We have eight hands-on opportunities organized under three different overarching themes that we call tracks. So these tracks offer gradual learning steps that help participants develop capabilities in a sustainable and responsible manner. The hypergravity microgravity track you see on top is designed with the end goal of developing the capacity of running space experiments on board orbital vehicles or space stations. As you can see on the left hand side, we have our on ground opportunities. So as I've explained, we have drop tests using the Bremen drop tower to conduct microgravity experiments. Below that, we have HyperJest, which is in collaboration with the European Space Agency to conduct hypergravity experiments. And HyperJest is actually open now for applications. So if you're interested, please make sure to check HyperJest out as well. On the other side of the track, we have our on-orbit opportunities. One is utilizing the Bartolomeo platform on board the International Space Station with Airbus. Another opportunity is utilizing the Chinese Space Station in collaboration with the China Man Space Agency. And last but not least, um, we have one opportunity to utilize the Dream Chaser vehicle in collaboration with Sierra Space. Under that, you see the satellite development track, which aims to build the capacity to develop, operate, and utilize a satellite. And of course, microgravity experiments can be conducted here as well. Um, on this, we have two opportunities. One, all of you are interested, so that's why you're here, but we have KiboCube. And another opportunity we have is um, with Avio, utilizing the Vega C launcher. And last but not least, you see the exploration track, which is a relatively new track that we opened this year. And it is set to cover aspects related to space exploration and beyond geostationary orbit. Currently, we only have one opportunity. Um, it is the provision of telescopes um, in collaboration with the Keldish Institute in Russia. And we hope to open more opportunities soon. So um, as I explained earlier, um, there are two components that will support the hands-on opportunities. Um, through the tool component, we will bring together information on different types of software platforms that applicants can use, for example, designing, planning, calculating, analyzing, validation, testing, and all that. 
And the education component, um, we will bring more information about webinars, workshops, trainings, um, MOOCs, um, massive online courses, teachers' guides, curriculums, fellowships. So the ones in gray are the ones that we are still in production right now, but the ones in black um, are the ones that we already have. So for webinars, especially for the satellite development track, we have an amazing series that we did with JAXA and um, UNICEF Global called KiboCube Academy, which provides um, the theoretical knowledge you would need to um, utilize um, to design, um, develop, design, utilize, and operate a satellite. And for workshops and trainings, um, we have many events coming up as well. And especially for fellowships, I'd like to emphasize, since it is related to the satellite development track, that we have one opportunity open, which is called the Postgraduate Study on Nanosatellite Technology, PNST. This is in collaboration with the Kyushu Institute of Technology, QTech, and it will provide you um, a, an opportunity to study about satellite technology in QTech. Okay, let's get into KiboCube now. So what is KiboCube? Um, it is a cooperation program between us, UN USA, and Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, JAXA, and it has been um, it started from 2015. Um, the main aim is to provide educational research institutions from developing countries with opportunities to deploy CubeSats, a 1U CubeSat, which they deploy and manufacture um, from the International Space Station, um, the Kibo module, which um, my colleague, um, Ms. Shibano, will explain later. So why KiboCube? First of all, CubeSats offer a large variety of applications and developing a CubeSat can be the first step um, for a country in acquisition for the skills and know-how needed to develop a space program. Second, CubeSats are very affordable to develop and represents an achievable entry point into space activities. And especially for KiboCube, JAXA will bear the cost of the launch of the CubeSat to the ISS and deployment from Kibo which is really helping in the cost part as well. Third, since the CubeSat that you will be um, developing will be sent up to the ISS as cargo, um, there is lower vibration and more friendly environment during launch compared to um, being on a launcher and being deployed. And last but not least, there will be administrative support from us, UN USA, and a lot of technical support coming from JAXA during the development. Um, I know <laughs> you might be fed up with all the SDG stuff, but KiboCube is um, contributing to the SDGs um, by fostering innovation and supporting education and training on skill sets, skill sets for developing cutting edge technology. So SDG 4, 8, and 9 are the main targets of um, KiboCube, but as I explained earlier, the projects that you will bring and the projects and the applications that will be connected to each of your projects will be um, reaching more SDGs. As you can see here, we've um, conducted five rounds. We have six teams. Um, three teams have actually finished their development and they have deployed their satellites. So Kenya, Guatemala, Mauritius. And currently we have the teams from Indonesia, Moldova and Sika um, developing their satellites. Um, we conducted the sixth round and we are under selection for the two winners right now. So um, all of you are here to apply to the seventh round. So I will go into a bit detail on how to apply to the seventh round. So you can find all the documents on our website um, under the page called KiboCube Rounds. Um, I hope my colleagues will put in the link in the chat. Please make sure to read the announcement of opportunity document, which is very important. The CubeSat mission application template, well, this is the application form that my colleague Jorge will explain later to you in detail. It is very important. Um, the GEM payload accommodation handbook, um, this is an important technical document that you will need to read for the interface. And um, this is, I would say, the, one of the most important documents that you would need to read, so please make sure to go through that and the guidance on space object registration and frequency management for small and very small satellites. So um, we have been conducting a bunch of webinars that could support your application. I will go through them. So one is KiboCube Academy. I will call it season one. Um, this was a series of four webinars that um, dived into theoretical technical knowledge on how to develop, operate, and utilize a satellite. We did this webinar series um, in January, February, March um, this year. Um, we did this in collaboration with UNSEC Global. Um, 
with um, the Japanese professors there in the universities. So please make sure to check out Kibo Cube Academy season one, the four webinars that you can find there. Another one is the tips for the access to space for our application. We conducted a bunch of webinars last year um, in fall, um, which can help you in different areas such as communication, awareness raising for your project, um, space law and regulations, innovative technology such as AI. So we have um, webinars that can help you in those areas. And last but not least, we had a a webinar last year in World Space Week 2020, um, and we gathered past winners from KipoCube. So you will be able to learn about their experiences there. So please make sure to check that one out. And this is the coming, uh, the webinars that are coming up. So um, this is KipoCube Academy season two. So we have three types of different activities under KipoCube Academy season two. One will be on-demand lectures, so we hope to start this later in October. It will be a series of 21 lectures that are pre-recorded, so you will be able to access the lectures anytime and have a one-hour lecture on the contents that you see on the right-hand side. So we will have the initial 15 um, lectures coming up hopefully in late October, and then next um, 15 to 21 will be provided next year. So in that sense, it might not be relevant to the people of the seventh round, but still we still have KiboCube Academy season one that can help you in those areas as well. But anyway, we will be having a number one and a number one to number 15 coming up in October. So please make sure to check um, these lectures out. Second, um, we will be having live lectures. So compared to on-demand lectures, where you will be just um, be able to view the videos. Um, live lectures will give you an engaging place uh, where you can um, engage with the professors from UNICEF Global and ask them questions, um, not only to UNICEF, of course, to um, UNOS and JAXA as well. So um, there will be lectures provided, we will have three lectures, sorry, provided, uh, one about CubeSat technologies, the second will be about launch and operation of CubeSats and regulations, and the third will be the introduction of CubeSats um and environmental test facilities so all of these are live lectures so please make sure to join us and um get the most out of it and last but not least we have we will have technical son consultations so um this is a new um topic that we are actually starting um we are trying to conduct one-on-one -on -one cons consultations our technical consultation with teams that are interested in applying for the seventh round um we will take um, a few teams. Of course, we will open applications for that later in the year. Um, please make sure to check out our web page. But anyway, we will be opening um, slots for technical consultation with us, JAXA and UNISEC to help you um, update and answer any questions that you may have about your specific um, satellite. So um, KibuKib Academy season two, we have a lot of things um, that will be coming up. So please make sure to check out our website um, for the latest material. So I will quickly go through the announcement of opportunity um, document that you will need to read. Um, since it was published in July, I hope that many of you had the time to go through it. Um, just going through, um, the deadline for the applications is the end of this year, so the 31st of December 2021. And for this AO, we are opening um, the slot for two entities. So we have one U CubeSat slots for two entities. So the maximum will be the maximum amount of winners will be two entities. Um, this is the program schedule. Sorry, my screen is a bit slow. So, OK, I hope you see it. Um, as I told you, that deadline is the 31st of December. After that, we will be um, giving we will be selecting and giving this announcement of the shortlisted applicants in the middle of February. After that, each team will um, need to update their um, applications, especially in the securing of the funding, and they will need to uh, um, send us their updated applications um, by the end of May. After that, we will go through our second round selection and um, be able to announce the winners, hopefully in the summer. And after that, um, the development schedule will start and it will be from 15 to 18 months. Um, it is special um, in this round that um, there is a strict schedule with the ISS operations. So please make sure that your um, your plan fits 
the program schedule. Second, um, the announcement of um, the eligibility. We have a lot of questions always coming in here, so um, please make sure to read this part um, carefully as well. Um, this opportunity is open to entities located in developing economies and economies in transition that are member states of the um, United Nations. So what is developing economies and economies in transition? Um, that is defined in the World Economic Situation and Prospects report that you can see here. Um, please make sure to check this document out and see which um, criteria your country, um, the country that your organization belongs in, um, belongs to. Um, one point that I would like to emphasize is that um, the seventh round is actually expanding the reach. Um, in the sixth round, we only had um, this opportunity open to developing economies, but now for the seventh round, we have opened it to economies in transition as well. So there are more countries that can apply to KiboQ. Um, more information on the eligibility. Um, the, in, the teams have to come from research institutes, universities, and other public organizations. Um, these are the teams that are eligible to apply. Private companies, non-governmental, and non-profit agencies are ineligible. However, you could be part of the team of the research institutes, universities, and public organization, organizations that are eligible. However, um, uh, I said part of the team, but um, not exactly to be part of the team, but to have a partnership with them. Because in the application form, we will ask for team members, and those team members must all come from eligible um, institutes, so the research institutes, universities, and public organizations. But if you see the application form, you will see that there is an area where you can include um, organizations that you're partnering with. So if you have any private companies, NGOs, NPOs that want to work with you, please include them there in the partnership part. Yep. And yeah, so for the eligibility, we have more information there, but please make sure to read um, the announcement of opportunity page. It is very important. Next, we have the selection criteria. I think it is relatively clear. Of course, we will be going through the technical um, parts as well, but please make sure that, as I mentioned earlier, there's a link between the CubeSat and the SDGs, and also that um, the CubeSat is in compliance with the space debris mitigation guidelines and the guidelines for the long-term sustainability of outer space activities. Roles and responsibilities. Um, this part, number 11, has the activities that the selected entity, so the team will be, have to, um, will be responsible for. Um, please note that the costs associated with the activities above, so mainly the development, delivering the satellite to JAXA in Japan, um, things like that, um, the employment costs, the travel expenses, and the transportation fees, all of that must be borne by the selected entity. Um, I think it is relatively clear, but please make sure to read it carefully. Um, last but not least, um, for the submission, um, please send it to us in PDF. Um, we would like to see um, the signed page, and uh, which we call document number one, the uh, document of letter of endorsement of the head of the entity. We'd like to see um, the PDF, the actual signed PDF of that. And for the CubeSat mission application document number two, please make sure to generate the word into PDF so that um, it's easier for, for us to see. Okay. Um, I'm sorry I talked a lot, but um, I will now give the floor to my colleague, um, Ms. Yasko Shibana of JAXA, to give you more details about the International Space Station, um, Kibo, and JSOD. If you have any questions about what I've mentioned earlier, please make sure to put it in the chat and we will um, answer them later on. So now I will give the floor to um, Ms. Shibano. Uh, hello everyone, uh, thank you for uh, coming today. So my name is uh, Yasuko Shibano uh, from JAXA. I am an um, engineer for uh, JSOC team. Uh, in this uh, section, I am going to talk to you about overview of uh, ISS Kibo and JSOC. 
Uh, first of all, I introduced of JAXA. So that uh, Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency was born through the merger of three institu institutions, uh, namely the uh, Institute of Space and Astronautical Science, the National Aerospace Laboratory of Japan, and the uh, National Space Development Agency of Japan. Uh, it was a uh, design as a core performance agency to support the Japanese government's overall aerospace development and utilization. And therefore, uh, JAXA can conduct uh, integrated operations from basic research and development to utilization. I'm showing the uh, representative project here. We have uh, some project, for example, a space transportation, a human space activities, satellite program and uh, aviation program, science, uh, space science, and uh, lunar plan and planetary explanation program. Today, uh, I'd like to explain about, of, about one of our human space activities missions. It is the CubeSat deployment mission. International Space Station is a huge mount uh, construction uh, located about 400 kilometers above the Earth. And it is a circle along the Earth at a speed of uh, 19, uh, minute, 19 minutes per orbit. The ISS project aims at improving science and technology to enhance life and uh, in, in industries on the ground. 15 countries are uh, participating in this uh, ISS project, including NASA, uh, Russia, Canada, and J JAXA. JAXA has uh, completed its uh, human space facility, the Japanese uh, experiment module, KIBO, uh, so it called KIBO, and uh, train, trained astronauts uh, who will operate the the ISS and Kibo at JAXA. Kibo has a pressurized module and an exposed facility. So a very part of missions can be conducted both inside and outside of Kibo. At the Kibo exposed facility, there were a lot of a unique system. It was an airlock uh, that was uh, payload to be moved from inside to outside, uh, outside the keyboard. And a small robotic car, this one, it called a remote manipulator system. So many missions can be op operated at the keyboard export facility. The one of them is uh, the one of them is a JSOT system. Uh, JAXA de developed this unique system to deploy the satellite and inject the orbit from Kibo. The table shows a uh, specific of JSOT. The satellite size is defined uh, as a, a unit and a one year is a cubic of 10 cm by 10 cm by 10 cm. The, cube, the JSOT can be released up to 6U satellite, and uh, 50 cross satellite can also be released. Uh, I guess it is moving in, the, in this direction of the um, cross X axis, and the satellite will be deployed uh, 55 degrees backwards for the uh, direction in which the uh, ISS is moving. The maximum deployment velocity is uh, 1.7 mm per sec, and the speed change depends on the mass of the satellite. For the deployment mechanisms of JSOT, that there is a big spring. This one uh, in, is uh, inside the JSOT case. And then separation mechanisms here is a set on the outside of the case. At the satellite is set, the big screen is uh, compressing and the satellite are uh, kept in the case by this door. When the separation mechanisms 
and received the command for release from the ground. The separation mechanism works, works and the door is opened. Finally, the satellite is but satellite in the case uh, pushed by the spring and deployed. Uh, there are two types of case that can carry a satellite, a carry and deploy a satellite, the signs of CubeSat. In the JSON case, the satellite is set to the case on the ground and the maximum size is 3U in the one slot. While in the JSON R case, the satellite is loaded into the launch case and uh, trans transported to the ISS uh, where it is stored in the cable module. In the cable module, the satellite will be transported to the deployment case by astronauts. So that JSON all can be used repeatedly and uh, can release max 6 year satellite in a slot. In addition, uh, also not shown here, uh, there are special cases for the wide 6 year size and 50 kilogram class size. Next, uh, I explain uh, how the developed satellite uh, will be transported to a space and deployed. First, the developed CubeSat is installed on JSON case and then packed into a curve transfer bag. Then uh, they are transported to NASA and are launched at specialized cargo by rocket. Uh, because of CDB bug, the vibration environment is lower than that of the rocket. After the JSON case arrived on the ISS, astronauts mount the JSON case on the platform. And then the platform is carried out of the ISS through the airlock. And then the robotic arm are carries into the deployment position. And astronauts get final check and the deploy and the satellite will be deployed. The operation commands to move the robot arm and to deploy the satellite are sent from the ground. Our flight control team and engineer team are in a perfect uh, condition and support deployment from the ground. The size of the satellite uh, is small, uh, but the mission is made possible by many support members. In this slide, uh, I'd like to introduce a few uh, advantages of small satellites uh, compared to large satellites. Uh, small ones are uh, attracted uh, considerable attention because of their short term, low cost, low, short term and low cost uh, development. They are uh, suitable for first time users and as a first step towards developing a large satellite to solve a social problem. Since the development cost is low, small satellites can be used as an educational tool and a challenging missions. And then small satellites can be developed in about one to two years and about one year of operation is expected. Therefore, our able college students can experience the whole process of satellite development and operation and users can get quick uh, get quick return on your business environment, technology demonstration, and so on. In addition, uh, practical remote sensing data can be obtained from a small satellite. It means that uh, su sufficient data can be obtained even with low cost and short term de development, which is uh, a great advantage in terms of cost effectiveness. Finally, I introduced the achievement for JSON. The JSON operation started in 2012, and this year marks the ninth year. JAXA have uh, continued to provide development opportunities, so uh, 38 satellites from uh, 17 countries have been successfully deployed from the JSON. As you can look at the world map, uh, we are uh, deploying 
deploying the satellite from all over the world, regardless of region. Also, a three of the satellites selected by KiboCube have been successfully deployed so far. Okay, uh, we are hoping to see many institutes apply for the seventh round of the KiboCube and explore their uh, possibility of space utilization. JAXA is uh, looking forward to supporting your uh, challenges. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Sibano, for the explanation about the International Space Station, Kibo, and JSOT. I will now like to give the floor to my colleague, Jorge Del Rio Vera, to explain more in detail about how to really fill in the application form that will be an important part of this um, seventh round uh, application. So I would like to give the floor now to Jorge. <clears throat> good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's very nice to, to be here with you. Uh, thank you very much, Hazuki, for, for, the, for the presentation. So uh, before I start, um, I would like to have uh, your cooperation and I would like to ask you a question. How many of you knew about KiboCube before coming to the webinar? And you can, you can write your answers in the chat. Uh, it's important information for us. And also, how many of you knew about uh, access to space before? I've seen that, they have, that there are a few questions in the chat, which is already good. Uh, don't hesitate to continue asking your questions in the chat. and We will be answering them. Um, so I see, for instance, Usam uh, Ahmed that said yes. Uh, Yasin said yes. Thank you. So, uh, and, and we have new people, uh, Roya. Thank you for, for joining us. So, we have been developing material for KiboQ for a long time. KiboQ is, is not a new opportunity in, in the office. We have, I mean, this is the seventh round, so, so you can imagine that there is a lot of heritage that you can actually utilize to build your application form. Uh, part of the, that heritage was has been mentioned by Hazuki. I, I would like to guide you a little bit through it. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay, this is good. So if you go to the to the YouTube channel of the office uh, and, and you go to videos, there are two things that you can be searching for. Uh, you can be searching for access to space for all, for instance, and there you would have webinars with previous winners webinars on space law and regulations that is very good for frequency allocation, for instance, which is a part of a very important part of, of your, your application. How to raise awareness about your project, how to build a communications plan that we are asking in the application form. So that information is there for you. Use it. Uh, it's, it's very important that, that you are coming well prepared because the applications that we are getting are better and better each round. So, so the more prepared you are, the more you read and the more information that you can obtain, the better your application is going to be. Uh, and that's that's very important. Um, then uh, again, if you are searching in the in the YouTube of the of the office for KiboQ, uh, Hazuki was mentioning a lot of material uh, that is already there, like the the KiboQ uh, Academy. And, and you have all the videos there. They, they, they are very good material. I mean, they, they have been prepared by JAXA, they have been conducted by UNICEF Global, and they provide you a wealth of information that you can utilize to have a better application form. Don't hesitate, use them. On top of that, we have a video on applying to KiboQ that was done last year in December, and that video contains information, very detailed information about the application form. I would not like to, to, to repeat myself today, so that's why I was asking you who is new, uh, who already knows a, a little bit about KiboQ. Uh, and, and I have another question to you, uh, because it's important information for us. How many of you are thinking in applying to KiboQ? And, and please write your, your answers in the chat. So this is very good material. We have two webinars. I mean, you see here that this like uh, like uh, a couple uh, because we are normally when we are doing a webinar, we are doing one in the morning, one in the afternoon to cover different time zones. The content is the same, but the questions that you may get at the end are different. So 
if you see just one of them and then you go to the end of the other, you may get a little bit more of information about that. Um, so then uh, let's dive in into the application form, the actual application form uh, of KiboCube. There, there are a few changes with respect to, to the one of the sixth round. So if you're familiar with the sixth round, it's not that you have to start everything from scratch, but there are small deviations that are referred to some of the things that Hasuki was mentioning before. One of them is the, the, the composition and the structure of the teams. So the, the application form has a lot of instructions on how to complete it. Please read it carefully. That's very important. You will have to read, read and read. And if you have any questions, I mean, Hazuki was putting already the, the email address where you can ask your questions. So don't hesitate. We are here for you. Um, so going to the table of contents, Basically, in the first section, we are asking for basic information. There is a very important part for us that is the certificate. And the certificate page looks like this. Hazuki was, was referring to document one, document two. Document one is uh, an endorsement letter of your institution saying that you are actually, um, <clears throat> your institution is actually supporting that you are engaging in, in KiboCube. And, uh, and I see that there is now a poll. So please, please complete the poll. That that's that will be very useful information for us. Uh, um, and then there is a part of the from the endorsement letter. There is another very important document for us, or part of the document very important for us, which is the certificate. In here, in the certificate, we are asking to get signatures, scan this page, and send it send it to to us scanned, so we can see that uh, the signatures there were were original. Also, we are asking for seals. So if your organization has a seal, please use it here. That would be also very, very good and very important for us. You see, we are asking for the seal of organizations that are applying. And you, you also see here in the application form uh, in this part that there is the possibility of having several applying organizations. I mean, if you will be working with Another organization that is eligible, and this is very important, it has to be an eligible organization according to the, the announcement opportunity guidelines. So go to the announcement opportunity. There, it, there is a section on eligibility and read that section carefully because if you are putting here in the certificate an organization that is not eligible, unfortunately, we will have to not consider your application for this round. So have that very much in mind. It has happened. We have a application in the sixth round that unfortunately uh, uh, we had to, to reject because of uh, an entity that was not eligible being mentioned in the certificate. So be very mindful with that. That's very important. So then if we, we continue, there were questions in the chat about the team composition. Uh, you can have as many team members as, as you want. I mean, there, there are no limitations on uh, team members. It's it's not a problem. There was a question by Anch in, in the chat about that. I think it was Anch. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, one thing that is very important that you are uh, taking into consideration is that <clears throat> we want as much as possible gender balanced applications. I mean, having an application that is a team that is composed by only men and that's kind of something that is very typical and we have seen recurrently in the past is not going to be very positively evaluated. I mean, it will have less chances of being successful compared to another good application that has a, a balanced team. And we are asking for inclusivity. So, so please take that into account. I, I mean, we are living in a world that is mixed, that uh, it has a variety of, of people. Uh, we want to see represented that in the application form. So, so be sure to take that into account. Um, another thing that is very important is that when you have several organizations that are taking part in, in the application, I mean, we were mentioning before that you, you can have several um, applying organizations mentioned in the certificate. In here, we would be asking you to explain a little bit the role and the responsibilities of each of the applying organizations. That's very important for us. 
So, so just explain there if there are, for instance, two universities that are applying together for, for KiboCube, what each of the universities is going to be doing with respect to the project that you are proposing. We would like to see that. We don't like to see that there is two, two uh, entities applying and, and we don't understand what each of the entities is doing. And maybe later we, we discover that one of the entities is actually not doing anything. I mean, we, we definitely don't want that and that's why we, we are asking for that information here. We want to see what is the involvement of each of the entities. And also in this section, in section number two, which is about teams and, and how you are composing your, your structure to apply, there is an additional section which is new, which is about external support. Well, actually, the description of the cooperation and external support are new. Uh, in the external support, what we are asking is, OK, maybe you have an entity that you would like to cooperate with to create the application, but they are not an eligible entity. But you are going to request support from this entity and it's going to play an active role in the application. Maybe that is the entity that is going to provide you the testing facilities and you are going to be testing in the facilities of that uh, external support. Or maybe you are uh, liaising with uh, amateur radio organizations in your country. Uh, and because they are an NGO, they are not a, they, they cannot apply, they cannot be part of the of the of the application as leading entities, but they can be considered external support. So that's what we would like to see in the external support section. So if you have external organizations that are not eligible but are helping you actively in the application, or if you have in individuals, I mean, we have had cases where there, there was a very active person uh, supporting a team, a person that was engaged in, I mean, it was, uh, he had the experience, but was able to provide some free time to the team to, to actually get the team to, to speed. Include them there and include all the relevant information so we can actually check and assess uh, the, the, the team as a whole also uh, taking into account the external support that you are getting. That's very, very important for us. <clears throat> so those are those are two changes uh, in the in the application also related to the teams. You have a work breakdown structure. I mean, for the external support, we are asking you to provide the description in, in section number two, but we would like to see exactly in terms of work packages. So you basically divide the work that you have to undertake to take the, the CubeSat uh, into a space and to operate the CubeSat. You divide that into work pieces. We call them work, uh, work packages. Uh, you can find more information about how to build uh, work breakdown structures in the internet. It's, it's very simple. Well, in the work breakdown structure, we would like to understand who is doing what of the individual steps that are leaving leading you to the completion of the, of the CubeSat and to the operations of the CubeSat. So we would like to, to know also in the case of partnership, what is the share of the work among the different partners in the work packages? I mean, maybe there is a work package that contains two applying entities plus one support entity. We would like to understand what is the share of the work that is going to take each of the entities in that work package. So all this is to help us understanding what is going to be the team's dynamic and, and how the team is going to be working and what is the, the support that the team is getting. Those are very important elements for us and, and, and we are emphasizing this time uh, because we have seen mistakes in, in, in past applications on that. Uh, more stuff that you have to be aware. As I said, we explained the whole application form in previous webinars, so I'm not going to repeat myself. I, I really recommend you that you go through those webinars and, and have a look. Um, one thing that um, that I would like to make emphasis also that is coming from the from the previous round is is the, the description of the cubes, the, the detailed specifications and the detailed description. Uh, in there, you have system block, block diagrams um, and the list of components. So if we go there, we will see that. Uh, those sections are asking a part of the of all the subsystems that you are in the in the in the CubeSat. You will have section 
5.2.3, that is the description of the interfaces, and if you scroll down about the subsystems. So there are things that you have to consider when you are designing the CubeSat. You are going to build a system, which is the CubeSat, uh, and its operations, and that will be composed of different subsystems. We want to understand how those subsystems are going to work. So it's, it's not enough that you are providing us and only with the block diagram, saying, okay, it's good, there is going to be a, a communication subsystem, there is going to be an attitude and orbit determination and control subsystem, there is going to be, I don't know, a power, uh, an EPS electric power uh, subsystem. We, we know that, I mean, those are basic blocks of a CubeSat. We want to see where are you going to put inside of those blocks. Maybe you don't have to go at component level. Of course, it's better if you go at component level, but we want to understand that you understand the pieces that are inside those subsystems, and you are detailing that for us. Um, so we are sure that your, your application is complete. Uh, <clears throat> the same goes to the, to the, to the interfaces. We don't want to see that EPS, for instance, electrical power uh, subsystem is connected to the rest of the subsystems. Of course, that, that is something that we know. We want to see which type of connections you are going to have. Are you going to change the voltage? Uh, are you going to be supplying different voltage for different components? Those are the things that when you are describing the interfaces of the, of the different subsystems, and we have the electrical interface there, uh, you are providing that information to us. So we have a good grip of how you are going to build uh, the satellite. Maybe you don't have all the details in detail at component level uh, for your CubeSat. I mean, you are doing the design and you are going to be ref refining your design as you go. But uh, please provide as much detail as possible there. It is really, really important for us uh, to see that you have understood how uh, you are going to conduct the whole process and, and how you are going to design the queues. Um, then um, there is something that, uh, I mean, the schedules it's, it's, and, and verification plans are, are simple, are, are things that are, that are easy to, 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 to build. You have all the information, as I mentioned in, in previous videos. Um, there is one section more here in, in section five, which is very technical, which is a technical section, which is about technical heritage. Let's say that in your country, your institution had already experience in building CubeSats, and you would like to expand your knowledge and to make an advanced version of, of a CubeSat that you have already built. We would like to understand that, and we would like to understand what is the technical heritage, which is <clears throat> the delta that you are uh, putting into the new CubeSat. We just don't want to see repetitions of the same project, uh, trying to take advantage of a free launch opportunity and deployment opportunity. We want to see how you are improving your capabilities. I mean, the CubeSat, uh, Cube at the end is, is, an, is a capacity building uh, opportunity. So we want to see how capacity is being developed and repetition of something that has been already successful is not developing any capacity. Um, additional things that you have to take into consideration. Well, if you are going into this section, in the technical section, maybe we I, I can go there uh, to the top. Um, so you will see in the top um, that we are referring to a very important document that you have to take into consideration. You have references all the documents that you have to utilize for building your application form inside the document. Please pay attention to the to the GEM payload accommodation handbook. Compared to the one we have last year, this is a new revision. And we have included things that you have to take into consideration about this new revision in your application form. Of course, the whole document is something that you have to take into consideration, but we have done some work for you to specify some of the things that we would like to see in the application. Be sure that you are using the right one and be sure that you are using the GEM payload accommodation handbook and you are not using any, any other uh, deployer manual that is on board of the ISS. We are using the JSON deployer, 
which is the deployer that is used in this opportunity. So if you are complying with another deployer that is on the ISS, it might be that you will not be compliant with this. So we will have to make comments to your application and that will not qualify good for your application. So that is very important. Keep all those documentation and read all documentation uh, very carefully. And if you have questions, don't hesitate. So let me go a little bit more down. So as I said, uh, there are things that are mandatory. There are things that are optional. Uh, it, all that is written in the instructions, with which things are mandatory and which things are optional. Um, I would like to go a little bit more down to something that is very important for us, which are the space debris mitigation guidelines and the guidelines for the long-term sustainability of outer space activities. Um, those are international guidelines that have been agreed by the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. Um, they are guidelines, but we would like to see how you are going to be compliant with the guidelines. So we are asking you to do an extra piece of effort uh, and state compliance to the guidelines. And the guideline documents you can find, I mean, you have the links in there. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the way the documents look like, and I hope that it's not going to start talking, let's mute just in case. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, it's, it's very simple document and the guidelines are very simple, very well stated. Uh, you have limit every release during normal operations. So maybe your CubeSat is going to be expanding the, the solar panels. And maybe there is a risk by opening a foldable uh, solar panels that you are <clears throat> releasing debris. So we, in that case, we would like to see how you are going to limit the release of that debris in accordance with guideline, I'm sorry, with guideline number one. Probably it is very small for you to see it, right? Um, and so have a look at the guidelines and explain to us how you are going to be compliant. Don't talk general. Please reuse your design, use your concept, use your CubeSat. I mean, we had statements of compliance that were saying limit debris release during normal operation, compliance to guideline one. Yes, we are compliant. Full stop. No. <laughs> Please explain to us how you are going to do that. I mean, the fact that you are stating compliance saying, yes, we are compliant, is not enough. So just go through the guidelines. I mean, the guidelines are very well explained. Just explain to us how you are going to implement them, if they are applicable. I mean, it might be that there is uh, there are guidelines that are uh, not applicable in your case. That can happen. Uh, for instance, uh, part of guideline number six, uh, launch vehicle orbital stages. I mean, there is no control that you're going to have over the launch vehicle orbital stages, so you don't have to stay compliance to that part uh, of the guidelines. And in the case of Kibo, Kibo, it's very easy to limit the presence of the spacecraft in low Earth orbit because you are going to be deployed in the orbit of the International Space Station. And by nature, by the laws, the laws of physics, the, the satellite is going to be burning into the atmosphere in a couple of years time maximum. So uh, a guideline like number six is very easy to be compliant to. But we would like to see that you have done the maths uh, for your CubeSat. I mean, you, you, you will have a ballistic profile of, of your CubeSat and, and that will have an influence when, when the, the CubeSat is going to decay and, and, the, and the time to decay. So, so we would like that, to see that you have made the analysis. And these links, with something that we are working on to make your application easier. It's not, unfortunately, it's probably not going to be ready, which is the tools component of Access to Space for All. We want to make a collection of open source tools that can help you understanding better the behavior of your spacecraft. I'm, I'm sure you have software, and there, there are pointings to software in KiboCube Academy. Just, just have a look at, at that series. But in the future, there will be a tools component uh, supporting Access to Space for All, which will, which will have tools that will help you uh, building those uh, compliance statements. So read well the guidelines and please state compliance. Then there is another guideline mentioned there, which is the, the guidance for the long-term sustainability of outer space activities of, of COPOS. Most of, most of these guidelines 
are talking about countries, are talking about states. Uh, you see states in a relevant uh, and relevant international intergovernmental organization should blah blah uh, should do things. Um, <clears throat> so if you go to actually the, the 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 body of the guidelines, you will find things like that. But there are uh, there are guidelines. Uh, for instance, you cannot adopt, revise, and amend uh, <clears throat> a framework. For, for outer space activity. If there is a framework in your country, you can actually incorporate it in, in your design. And you will have to do that probably by law. Uh, <clears throat> so there are things here that are not necessarily for you. I, what we would like that you do is that you examine carefully the guidelines. I mean, it's, it's part of the capacity building effort that you are reading these documents and you are aware of these documents. And you are telling us the ones that are applicable for your design and how you are going to build compliance towards that particular guideline. That's very important for us. <clears throat> that's, and, and that's also very easy. Uh, so that's something that we would like to see in this section number 7.3. Um, there is a uh, modification that we introduced in Kibo Cube 6 round. I, I would like to, to go a little bit on, on, on detail on that because it's, it's the same for Kibo Cube 7 round. Uh, we have a two-step application process. Uh, in the first step, what we are caring most is about the design, the schedules, uh, compliance to international guidelines, how you are uh, incorporating the sustainable development goals in your design, those things. And we are aware, we are completely aware that building um, a cost plan in the beginning is, I mean, you can have cost estimates, but maybe you don't have secure budget. And that's why we have this two-step application process. In the first step, you are presenting us with your design. You are presenting us how much it's going to cost. Maybe you have some budget that your institution is providing, or if you are in a consortium, the, the several institutions are providing, but you don't have all the budget secure. Well, <clears throat> at the end of that first phase of application, applications will be closed, we will do a pre-selection. So, with the preselection, you will get a preselected shown later if you have been preselected. What we hope is that that preselected uh, preselection letter is helping you to actually raise the remaining funds for uh, completing your cubes. Uh, it's very difficult to raise uh, funds if you have not been awarded or you have not been considered. I mean, in, in some countries, it's difficult because it's actually the first satellite of the country to, to, to build trust is is not straightforward and we are aware of that so that's why we are building this two-state process so at the end of stage one if you have been preselected you will get a letter from the office uh, stating that you have been preselected that will help uh, you to with that credibility uh, issue and and build uh, and raise funds in an easier manner hopefully that's that's what we are we hope and you will have to submit your revised application form, including the revised budget uh, and secure budget uh, in the second the second application phase. All that is very well detailed in the application form, in, in the announcement opportunity, and, and Hasuki has explained it very well uh, before. Uh, <clears throat> also, there are other, other uh, regulations you have to be aware. You have frequency allocation that is done with ITU. Um, we have also a very good video. Uh, uh, about that, just go there and check. I mean, if, <clears throat> as I mentioned before, so let's, I'm sorry. Uh, so if you are searching for Kibo Cube, uh, if, sorry, if you are searching for access to Space for All in the YouTube channel of the office, access, sorry, to Space for All, um, you will have you have a webinar that is about the space law and regulations. It's a webinar we conducted jointly with the International Telecommunication Union, and is talking exactly about those two aspects in the application form. Uh, have a look, watch it, and if you have questions, come back to us. Sorry, because this 
uh, webinar will help you with the frequency allocation and also in that webinar there were references to a space object registration that you will have to, that, to do with the, the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs. And uh, beyond that, I don't think there are any other new things. Another thing that is very important that we will be looking into is the, the, the compliance to the Sustainable Development Goals. Hazuki has gone through that. Don't just state that goal level, the Sustainable Development Goals are a little bit, uh, it's, it's an agenda that is a little bit more complex than just the 17 uh, Sustainable Development Goals. So if you discover the goals, you have the seven, uh, the 17 Sustainable Development Goals that were presented by Hazuki. But if you go inside each of the goals, you will see that uh, there are targets and indicators. We would like to see that you are building compliance to targets and indicators. Not only you are saying where we are contributing to um, no poverty and poverty in all forms everywhere. We would like to see that you are contributing to the, a target and you have the effort of uh, checking the targets and the targets are just down there. And each of the target has a number of indicators. So if you can go to the indicator level, it's even better. Um, I think that's it from my side. I don't know if JAXA colleagues would like to complement uh, information on the application form. The secret here is read, read, read. There are a lot of instructions. There is a lot of material that is available for you. Please check it. It has been done for you. It has been made for you so you can build the best application form that you can. Uh, thank you very much. And I, I leave the floor for, uh, to, to my JAXA colleagues in, in case they would like to add something um, to this presentation. Thank you very much, Jorge. Um, does our JAXA colleagues um, in Scuba Space Center have anything to add, any advice? Yes, uh, I'd like to add the information about the schedule. Um, uh, let me explain in detail about the, um, the CubeSat uh, will be deployed from the International Space Station. Uh, however, on the other hand, the end of lifetime of the International Space Station will be at the end of 2024. So, uh, uh, we have to deploy the old CubeSat um, uh, by the end of the, uh, 2024. So uh, we are going to uh, confirm the feasibility of the schedule uh, when we selected the entity in the, this uh, application round. So uh, we'd like to ask you to assess the um, uh, what is the uh, uh, tasks to develop, develop, develop the satellite or uh, assess the how, how much uh, the, each task takes the time. Uh, and uh, uh, please describe the detailed schedule uh, at the application form. Uh, I believe that uh, the schedule assessment is uh, difficult uh, before the starting the development, uh, but uh, uh, it's a schedule is a um, strict, uh, strict constraint uh, at this time. So uh, uh, please assess the schedule in detail. That is a comment. Thank you very much, Jaxa, for that comment. Yes, um, for the seventh round, um, as he explained, um, the schedule is very critical. So please make sure that your plan um, is in line with the schedule plan that is in the announcement of opportunity. Okay, so um, I'd like to move on to the Q&A. I see that some of the questions, well, actually most of the questions have been answered already, but I will um, address them here and then we can have people elaborate on that as well. So um, the first question was from a Angie and she was asking um, about the actual missions 
um, of the Kibo Cube um, projects that the applicants will bring in. So she was asking um, if Kibo Cube satellite missions are limited to Earth observations or if they can be used to detect emissions from other stars such as the sun. I see Goto-san, um, you've answered it, but can you explain again um, what you've explained in the chat? Uh, yes, um, uh, yes. I uh, as I um, uh, posted on the chat window, but uh, uh, observation is a common one of the common mission. So uh, uh, many people uh, have a camera on a satellite and they observe the Earth or star uh, or something. Uh, but uh, it's not limited to that uh, mission. Um, for example, the uh, they. Um, test to confirm the effect of the radiation to uh, material itself or electrical circuit board. Uh, it's so-called uh, uh, single event effect or something. So uh, that is uh, uh, one of the common mission. Or uh, they he test uh, communication between the ground and the satellite uh, with their own new protocol. Uh, that is a uh, very good uh, mission uh, using the CubeSat. So uh, uh, it's in fact uh, the mission is free, uh, and it, it's dependent on the each idea. So uh, it's not limited. Thank you very much, um, Goto Sam. Um, in the app announcement of app. Uh, announcement of opportunity document under selection criteria, you can see that um, the mission, if it's in compliance with peaceful exploration and use of outer space, and it's not intended solely for commercial, political, or religious purposes. Um, actually, we are open to any new ideas. Um, if it has a scientific and technical value, we are, um, as Goto-san mentioned, we are very open to new ideas that any of the applicants will bring in. So um, yes, um, we really look forward to new ideas as well. Okay. The next question um, was from Yasin asking about how many members each team could have. Um, I know this has been answered as well, but um, can our JAXA colleagues also elaborate on this one? Oh, yes. Uh, also, the, as I uh, posted in the chat window, but uh, I see uh, many cases, uh, many cases on uh, each project. It's depending on the uh, teams. Uh, some team has uh, several people, uh, two, two, three, four, five uh, people, uh, but uh, at the other team has uh, dozens of uh, people in uh, one team. So uh, it's dependent on the uh, uh, team's uh, cost project or uh, how much is the, um, how difficult is the mission and uh, keeps out. Thank you very much. Regarding the team members, I would also like to give advice that um, that there are different backgrounds that each person brings into the team. So if there's too many people working in the same field, and if there's too many people working on the payload, let's say, and there's not enough people working on the communication, or if there's um, areas that lack people, um, that's not exactly a balanced team. So please make sure that you have people in each of the um, important parts of the CubeSat itself and also the communication and all that. So please make sure it's a balanced team. And also, as my colleague um, Jorge mentioned earlier, we are looking for um, gender balanced teams. So that is something that you can take into consideration. Oh uh, yes, okay. I, I I added uh, uh, some comment. Uh, as Husky mentioned, that uh, uh, in some case the project team concentrated to our uh, own mission, uh, communication or something, uh, and uh, they purchased the uh, uh, codes product uh, of the bus system, uh, battery, uh, antenna, uh, OBC or something. So. Uh, uh, that they minimize the person to concentrate the payload itself, mission itself, and uh, purchase uh, the common product from the uh, company. That is uh, uh, one of the cases. Uh, so if, if, it's, if you selected the case, uh, please describe the team members and, uh, uh, on the application form. Uh, who is the uh, uh, mission team and uh, who is a uh, um, uh, support member from the outside. 
uh, so please describe on the uh, application form. That is all. Thank you very much for your additional comment. Um, at the moment, I do not see any more questions. So um, if you have any, um, oh, OK, um, I see one. I didn't understand the answer to the number of members question. So um, actually, we don't have any restrictions for the number of people. It could be one, well, one is a bit too small, I guess, but um, we do not have any restrictions. So um, you have six members here, which seems fine. But um, as we just mentioned, please make sure that people have um, different spe specialties in the technical backgrounds and the information they bring into um, so that it will be a balanced team um, so that you can um, basically um, develop the CubeSat um, and your own mission. Um, another comment I see. OK, um, from Archie, um, who is from Indonesia. Yes, we have a team from Indonesia that has one, um, but that has nothing um, to do um, with your team. So um, it means that even if there is a country that has already one Kibo Cube, um, you are open to apply. So um, yeah, please don't worry about that and bring in your application forms. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to write it in now. Um, while um, you guys are writing your questions, I saw one comment about how we can share the experience of the past teams. Um, I have put it in the chat. We have um, released an interview article with the Mauritius Research Innovation Council, um, I think last week. Um, it explains a lot about their experience from actually putting the team together and going through the Kibo Cube applications. Um, if you read it, you can see that they didn't um, pass in just one um, round. They actually submitted to one round. They didn't get selected and they went through another round. So you can see the many um, struggles and the issues that they had as well. So I think it would be an interesting read for all of you that are interested. And um, as my colleague Wenbin has been putting, we have the whole document package on our website. We have useful links. We have webinars, as Jorge has been mentioning. So please make sure to check out our website. I think it has a lot more information and um, in the coming weeks, I think we will be updating our website um, so that you will be able to learn more about the teams and each of the projects. So please make sure to check out our website um, at all times. Um, we will be providing a lot more information in the coming weeks and months. OK, I see another question from Aisha. Is it mandatory to have the payload developed by the team or can it be commercial on the shelf? Um, this is it mandatory to have the payload developed by the team? Um, honestly, because this is a capacity building opportunity, we do not recommend that you just buy a satellite that's on the shelf. Um, it would be better that the team is involved in the development process. Of course, there may be parts that you will need support, um, external support, maybe testing or um, yeah, there may be certain par parts that you will need help on, but we do um, hope that you and um, the teams will be part of the development process. Um, maybe my colleague Jorge or um, my colleagues at JAXA can um, add to this. Um, yeah, uh, of course, there, there are components that you will have to buy. Uh, and I mean, that's not a problem. If, if um, we would like to see how you are integrating the components, if there are developments that are at your institution that you would like to incorporate, we would like to see that and that very well reflected. Um, sometimes, uh, I mean, the, there are many commercial kits now nowadays in in the market that, that you can basically buy a commercial CubeSat kit and 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 have a, a CubeSat. Um, there is value to that. There is value to that if the country is the first time that the country is trying to or the the, the institution is trying to build a CubeSat. I mean, it's, it's a first learning step. Uh, of course, we would like to see as much capacity developed by the team as possible, but uh, there are options like that that you, that you can consider. The, the only thing that you, we are asking you in, in that respect is that you are explaining to us what you are doing and uh, which are the components that you are going to be developing in-house and which are the cuts, the commercial of the shelf uh, components that you are going to be incorporating and how you are integrating them in, in the different subsystems and, and how uh, the different subsystems are interfacing with each other. Uh, but that's yeah, that's that's an option. Um, 
I wanted to share, I mean, because there was a question before about the uh, sharing experience of other uh, applicants, and we had a very good webinar uh, last year. It's, it's very comprehensive because it's about all of the access to space for all opportunities that we have. It's, it's not only dedicated to, to Kibo Cube, but um, you can have their experiences and how they are incorporated that, uh, the experience of participating in an opportunity into, into the national uh, realities and, and the countries and how they are, for instance, building awareness and raising awareness about the project that they are doing. So, so this is very interesting material if, if you are uh, interested in applying. Thank you, Jorge. Um, is there anything to add from the JAXA side? Uh, we don't have uh, additional comment. Thank you. Um, adding to um, the webinar that Jorge just mentioned, that was um, including the other teams, uh, the other opportunities of access to space for initiative. But um, we had a webinar just for Kibo Cube winners. So we um, invited just the Kibo Cube winners, and we did that last year um, during World Space Week. Um, it's on our website as well. Um, it's called Enabling More Countries to Access Space Through the Kibo Cube Opportunity. And we have presentations from Guatemala, Mauritius, Indonesia, Moldova, and Sika. So you can get um, experiences from there as well. There you, in, in, in that slide, you see the different tracks of access to space for. Kibo Cube is under the satellite development track, but there are developments that you can be doing in other opportunities that are under other track that can be applicable to Kibo Cube. For instance, there was a team a few years ago that was testing the deployment mechanism for a, for a deorbit sail. And that was done in the Bremen Dock Tower uh, using the drop test opportunity that we have. So it would have been fantastic, and in that particular case, it didn't happen, that uh, the team that was conducting that experiment was coming to Kibo Cube and was actually putting that into orbit and seeing the actual behavior in orbit. Maybe you are running an experiment in microgravity in a few seconds in, the, in a drop tower, but you would like to repeat that experiment in orbit, and maybe the one U size is enough uh, for conducting that, that experiment and having all the hardware that is needed. So, Utilize the different opportunities that we have. I mean, of course, Kibo Cube, as as Gotosan was mentioning before, we have a limitation in the in the extension. Limitation is is uh, due to the to ISS uh, operational schedule and, and other factors. But there is cross fertilization among the different opportunities. So so utilize all of them because they they are they are for you. Uh, if you have any heritage of any ex experiment that you have been running. Maybe not through an access or, uh, to space for all opportunity, but maybe through another opportunity that you had. Use that heritage to apply for this opportunity because that that is something that we will value very positively to see the gradual uh, increase in capabilities and and, and in, a, in a sustained manner, as Azuki was mentioning in the introduction. Thank you. So the first question was from Marina Miranda. Um, she was asking, um, she was actually commenting, this is really a lot of information. Any recommendation on where to start? Yes, <laughs> honestly, we did provide you with a lot of information. But first of all, please make sure to go to this web page. Um, it's the Kibo Cube Rounds web page. So here you can find all the documents that you need to read and also reference documents. Um, also. Um, we have webinars, as I have explained earlier. So we have Kibo Cube Academy Season 1, um, which will be, um, which is already on our website, on the YouTube channel as well. Um, this will help you get ideas on, well, ideas, more, a lot of knowledge, theoretical knowledge on, and technical knowledge on how to develop, operate, and utilize a satellite. It's not only the technical parts, it will give you an idea of what a satellite can do um, to um, be able to provide solutions for any social or economic um, issues that you may have in your country. So please make sure to um, check out the Kibo Cube Academy Season 1 webinars. I think you will get a good idea of what CubeSats can do and how you can start um, developing the satellite itself. Um, and the other webinars, as I've mentioned earlier, the tips for access to space for all, Jorge was explaining it in detail again. Um, there are many parts of the application form where we ask 
um, things that are not technical. So we ask for a communication plan. We ask for how you're going to raise awareness within your country. So please check out these webinars. It will give you tips. Um, there's a webinar about space law and regulations, as Jorge mentioned. So um, you can check out those webinars that can help you um, fill in the parts of the application. Um, this third one, World Space Week 2020, this was a webinar that we collected the Kibo Cube winners. So this will give you an overview of the experiences they had. So checking out all these webinars, I think would be a good start, but also just really make sure to go through all these documents that you see here. Um, anything to add from Jorge or from JAXA on where to start? <laughs> this is a lot of information, but any advice from both of you? The only thing that I can add is if you have any questions, if, if you are confused, we have our contact email address in the in the application form, in the announcement opportunity also. So just send us an email. <laughs> as simple as that. If you have questions or if, if you have doubts, don't hesitate. We, we are here for that. Thank you, Jorge. As he mentioned, I hope you see the screen. This is the address that will reach Jorge, me, and Wenbin, and everyone on the Access to Space for All team. If there's any technical stuff, we can also share it with Jax as well. So please make sure to send us um, questions if you have them. OK, I will move on to the second question, which is how much time is left to submit the application? So all the information is written on the announcement of opportunity document. This presentation is actually taking screenshots of the actual announcement of opportunity document. So please make sure to check that out. The deadline is the end of December. So the 31st of December of this year, 2021. So you have um, right now it's September. So you have a few months um, to provide us with your application forms. So um, although, as, as you've seen, the application form is a lot of pages when you get started, I think um, you will be able to fill in the information. And yeah, I, I think you still have enough time to start. So please make sure to um, start checking out the documents and webinars and get your start, um, get your head start. Um, the next question is, could you repeat what organizations are allowed to apply? This is written on this page, so please make sure to check out number 10 requirements of for participation um, A eligibility criteria. So I will repeat, um, this opportunity is open to entities located in developing economies in economies in transition. So the first thing you have to do is check where um, your country is in this um, criteria, which is developing economies or economies in transition to check um, which um, criteria your country is in. You will need to go to this World Economic Situation and Prospects report. And um, there is a page that has a list of the countries um, under developing economies and under economies in transition. So please make sure to check where your country is. And if your country is um, located under developing economies or economies in transition, um, Country-wise, you are able to apply. So the next step will be to make sure that your entity is eligible. So the eligible entities are research institutes, universities, and other public organizations. So private companies, non-governmental or non-profit agencies are ineligible. So to apply, you must be a research institute, university, or public organization. And as I mentioned earlier, and as Jorge um, detailed, um, mentioned the details, if you are a private company or an NGO or NPO that wants to be part of um, KiboCube, you will need to be a partner of a research institute or university or public organization that is eligible. So you'll need to build a partnership with them, but you will not be part of their team. You will be a partner for them. Um, besides that, um, just to emphasize you can, this team this partnership it doesn't have to be from the same country so country a country b um it doesn't really matter and it doesn't um there's no restriction of numbers of um institutes that can be part of a team so you can be just one institute you can have five institutes in the team or um, in the partnership and we had a question earlier in the morning on how many people can be part of a team 
honestly, we don't have any restrictions. You can have one person, a one person team, which I think is a bit difficult, but um, technically it's um, OK. So one person or you can have 20 people or five or six or anything. So we don't have any restrictions on that. It's just that it, the team has to be um, formed with people that are from research institutes, universities and public organizations that are eligible. Um, there was actually a good question um, from Francisco. Um, if I may use his example, he was asking if the, um, an NGO and a university were able to apply to this or uh, apply to this opportunity. Um, and that in his case, the university is eligible, but the NGO is not. So they will need to form a partnership. So the entity that will be um, providing us with the application form will be the university. But in that application form under the partnerships, the NGO will be mentioned. OK, um, the next question is, um, are there other opportunities for those who don't have sufficient knowledge for KiboCube? So um, I have two things I'd like to mention here. Sorry, I'm going back through the slides. So under the initiative, you can see that um, KiboCube is under the satellite development track, which is already an on-orbit opportunity. But if you're not prepared to do an on-orbit opportunity, in the above track, the hypergravity microgravity track, we have opportunities that are on ground. So it's starting from a small and a, a small and more simple um, system. So as you can see um, in the yellow circle, we have an opportunity called HyperJess, um, which is open right now. Um, it is a collaboration between the European Space Agency to conduct hypergravity experiments. So you can use this as a step because this is not um, developing a satellite. It's developing an experiment to be tested in the large diameter centrifuge facility at ESA. So this could be one small step that you could take before um, conducting on orbit opportunities. Um, we have actually a uh, webinar about Hypergest tomorrow at the same time. So if you're interested, please make sure to um, register for the Hypergest webinar as well. So I, um, I think that could be one entry step. And besides that, um, we have the education component. So we have a fellowship that is open called um, PNST. Um, this is an opportunity to study um, about satellite technology um, in Japan. So um, uh, this is not a short program, actually. It's a two year program for a master student. It will be a three year program for a postdoctorate student. But if you're interested, please make sure to check this web page out as well, because it will be really giving you the hands on knowledge and of course, theoretical knowledge that you will gain in classes as well. So these are some of the opportunities that you can take before applying to KiboCube. But if you're more advanced and you just need more technical knowledge or theoretical knowledge, the KiboCube Academy webinars that are there and also the ones that we will be providing in KiboCube Academy Season 2 can definitely help you um, with um, the information you need um, to apply to KiboCube. Um, if there's anything to add on the JAXA side or from my colleague Jorge about where they could start and how it, um, how they could um, get more sufficient knowledge about Kiboku. If there's nothing or if I covered it perfectly, I will go to the next question. Um, the next question is from Rafiki um, about the cost of the one U cube set development. Um, I saw um, our colleague at JAXA explaining in the chat, but maybe I can give the floor to um, Mr. Goto to explain and, and elaborate more in detail. Uh, yes, uh, this question is so difficult um, because uh, it is uh, uh, completely different uh, on uh, each project. Um, because uh, if the uh, team member or external support member have uh, uh, a lot of experience or um, hardware heritage or test facility, uh, the cost, the amount of cost is reduced. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, uh, if the uh, older team member doesn't have uh, any experience or the design of a CubeSat is complicated, 
or the component is expensive, uh, the amount of the cost is increased. So uh, it's, it is no standard cost uh, so far. So uh, you, you will estimate the cost and uh, by searching the uh, price of the component of the CubeSat by internet, so you, you're going to get uh, uh, some price or estimation uh, from the internet. Thank you so much. I think, um, I, I hope that answers your questions. Um, as Gotosan mentioned, it will definitely um, be different to each um, team, each project, what you want to do, who you work with. So yeah, we do not have an answer for that, but um, if you have any more questions or advice that you would like to, please send us an email and we might be able to help you. Okay, um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, go uh, ahead. Uh, one, one more uh, comment about uh, the the advantage of the CubeSat is uh, um, you you can launch and deploy a free of charge. Uh, this is uh, one of the uh, big advantage of the Cubes, uh, KiboCube program. So you don't have uh, don't have to pay for the launch and deployment. Thank you. Thank you for the um, comment. Yes, exactly. That is a super beneficial part of applying to KiboCube. Okay, the next question is, um, can cooperating institutes come from two or more different eligible countries? Yes, um, so as I've explained earlier, it, um, we don't have any restrictions on how many um, people or how many different countries can be part of a team. So um, please feel free to have a giant team, a, a giant international team as well. Um, the next question um, is about what 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 KiboCube actually is. I, I think uh, I was not able to really explain it well. So the opportunity, as Goto-san mentioned earlier, um, is to be able to deploy your CubeSat from the International Space Station free of charge. So that is what UNUSA and JAXA is providing to you. So your responsibility is to develop a CubeSat and deliver it to Japan, to JAXA. And through those steps, um, there will be um, uh, uh, coordination with JAXA to make sure that the safety and the regulations that need to be met for um, deploying are done so. So basically, it is your responsibility to build a CubeSat and bring to Japan. Um, I hope that that is clear. Okay, um, I see that there is another question. Um, I would like to know first if connecting to a GNSS satellite is under the scope of KiboCube, and if so, could we propose to connect to any GNSS satellite, or must it be a JAXA-supported satellite? So for this, um, I would like to actually give the floor to Goto-san if you can elaborate on this. Hi, uh, yes. Um... Actually, uh, connecting to a GNSS satellite is not mandatory under the KiboQ program. Um, in fact, uh, some CubeSat doesn't have any um, attitude, uh, attitude sensing or attitude control uh, in, the, in the satellite. So uh, uh, that they don't have any sensors or actuator. Uh, if the, your mission uh, need to connect to a GNSS satellite, uh, you, you're going to connect the satellite. And uh, most of the people connect to a GPS, American GNSS satellite. Uh, so uh, it, it is uh, easy to connect the satellite. And we are happy if you use a Japanese QZSS satellite, but uh, it's, it's not mandatory. Uh, so, uh, and uh, um, please note that uh, if you use, uh, uh, if you connect to a GNSS satellite, uh, you must use a space uh, graded GPS sensor uh, because uh, uh, GPS sensor for a ground uh, usage 
it, it cannot use in space. So please note that. Thank you very much. I think that was a clear answer. And I don't see any more questions. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to write it now. Um, before you leave, please make sure to answer our questionnaire. We would really like to hear your feedback on our webinars because we want to provide better webinars for you, of course. So if you have any comments or advice to us, please write it in the questionnaire form. OK, um, I do not see any more questions. Um, as I've explained earlier, if you do have any more questions, please feel free to send us an email here at UNUSA access to space at un.org. Also, as I've mentioned earlier, we have exciting things coming up for the Kibokuba Academy season two. Um, all the things will be updated on our website, so please come and visit our website sometimes, no, um, as often as you can, because we will be putting um, all the information there. And the recordings of today and the presentations that we did will all be posted on our website as well. So um, if your colleagues, your friends, um, if they missed out on today's webinar, um, you can um, tell them to check out our website and we will be providing everything there. So um, thank you so much for everyone who joined in. Um, it was a pleasure to engage with all of you. And we really hope to see a lot of applications coming in from all of you. Um, as I've explained tomorrow, we do have another opportunity open on Hypergest, so we have a webinar about that. Next Wednesday, we do have another webinar explaining about the PNST Fellowship. So um, if you are interested in actually studying in Japan about satellite technology, this is another chance that you can take. So please join us for those webinars as well. So um, thank you so much for everyone, um, and I hope to see you soon. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye.